An economy of grace is a body of work that starts out by street casting, finding young women in New York City and asking them to come into the studio and be fitted for couture one-of-a-kind gowns. I actually enlisted Givenchy to create works that responded to them as individuals. Ricardo Tichy, the fashion director of Givenchy, had a very uh, unique understanding of this proposition. In fact, we walked through the Louvre together and chose specific moments within the history of fashion and portraiture. We're used to seeing a Kehinde Wiley painting in urban gear. And I wanted to, ch to sort of flip the script. I wanted to flip the script in terms of the expectation of a type of fetishized ur urban look. But I also wanted to look at how we fetishize couture, how we think about this kind of high-priced luxury good. The gowns actually we saved so that they can go and be auctioned off. The idea there was, was that they would have much more power as cash that would go towards organizations that serve the underprivileged communities from which the women came. Imagine a world where the classic art pieces of the past are completely reimagined with a modern and diverse twist. Like this, the famous 1800 portrait of Napoleon crossing the Alps. It becomes this. Bright colors, camouflage pants, and Timberland boots. Or this portrait of a couple from the 1600s becomes this. Two modern young men in t-shirts and casual pants. It all springs from the vivid imagination of the popular American artist Kehinde Wiley, challenging the viewer to think deeply about the dynamics of power and race. And the world is taking note. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has awarded Wiley the Medal of Arts just this past January. And his studios are all over the globe, including one here in Brooklyn. And his latest exhibit is touring museums across the United States. Kehinde Wiley, welcome to the program. Thank you. So of all those pictures, which are really amazing and fabulous, the one of Napoleon crossing the Alps just got me because when I was a little girl, I had a book on horses. And guess what? That was in that book. Yeah. And here I see you making it into a modern masterpiece. That's right. What's your point? What's the objective of putting these you know, modern faces in this old art? Well, art is about communicating power, and it's been that way for hundreds of years. Artists have been very good at working for the church and for the state, communicating the aspirations of a society. What I choose to do is to take people who happen to look like me, black and brown people all over the world increasingly, and to allow them to occupy that field of power. You famously say, and it's written about how you started, that one of the, the, the key turning points was finding a mugshot on the ground in L.A. where you grew up. And that created this whole sort of genre that you have developed. Tell me about the mugshot and where it's led you. Right. It was a day in Harlem. I remember it like it was yesterday, walking down the street. And here's this crumpled piece of paper. And on it is a very sympathetic image of this young man. And it turns out to be a mugshot photo. And it got me thinking about mugshots, certainly, but also mugshots as a type of portraiture. What is portraiture? It's choice. It's the ability to position your body in the world for the world to celebrate you on your own terms. The mugshot, of course, removes all of that power, all of that control. And it got me also thinking about the role of an artist within a society. What can I do to start a broader conversation about presence and imminence and the, and the desire to be seen as respected and beautiful in this world? You've also said about this idea of young black people who get arrested and mugshotted. Yeah. I know how young black men are seen. They're boys, they're scared little boys oftentimes. I was one of them. I was completely afraid of the LAPD. So your history also obviously informs what you're doing and what you're trying to communicate. This is something that cannot be uh, taken for granted. The sense in which the humanity of the people in my paintings is what I'm about. Mm -hmm. I'm about looking at each of those perceived menacing black men that you see in the streets all over the place people that you oftentimes will walk past without assuming that they have the same humanity, fears, uh, that we all do. There is nothing menacing uh, when you happen to walk through the world in this body. I understand blackness from the inside out. What my goal is, is to allow the world to see the humanity that I know personally to be the truth. And you've also said that, you know, you, you are putting brown and black faces into a world of art that's only ever really had white faces. And also, people have said that actually your work should, should startle. 
it should startle anyone, regardless of race, creed, or color. Well, the world's a scary place. The role of an artist is to look at that world as it is and to imagine alternate possibilities, but also to heighten what actually is. What can I do as an artist that hasn't already been done before? Look closer. My job is to walk through the streets, find someone who's minding their own business, trying to get to work, stopping them. The next thing you know, they're hanging on a great museum throughout the world. And it allows us to slow down and to say yes to these people, yes to these experiences, yes to these stories. And a lot of what you're showing also is these people, but wearing very hip clothes. You are not ashamed and shy of the brands. In fact, you celebrate the brands. Right. And even in a society, I mean, I remember you know, years ago in New York, you know, people were getting killed and in fights for shielding jackets That's and, right. for, and for trainers. That's right. And yet you're celebrating that. Well, what I'm doing is I'm looking at fashion as culture, fashion as serious business, where people will oftentimes dress themselves as a form of armor. Fashion is armor, and in so much as it says something about who we are in the world, it also protects us a bit. My work tries to concentrate on fashion as a conceptual color. It's a, yet another color in my palette to, to, to tell a story. You also have studios all over the world. Yep. Are you surprised by this amazing success? I am. I am. Every day I count my blessings. There's something to be said about the, the courage to just throw yourself into this type of work. I never thought in a million years that I'd be here having uh, the sex success that I do, but it says something great about America and about New York City that you can have a dream like this, that you can put one foot in front of the other, and people will say yes to what you're up to. And they have indeed. Kehinde Wiley, thank you so much for joining me thank here you. in the studio. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Welcome to the Jewish Museum in New York. I'm Karen Levitov, curator of the exhibition Kehinde Wiley, The World Stage Israel. The exhibition includes 14 of Kehinda Wiley's large-scale paintings, along with a selection of ceremonial textiles and works on paper from the Jewish Museum's collection that Kehinda Wiley chose for the exhibition. Let's take a look. This dramatic portrait was recently acquired by the Jewish Museum. It portrays a young Ethiopian Jewish man embedded in an intricate decorative background inspired by a ceremonial paper cut in the Jewish Museum's collection. The decorative motifs scroll onto the figure, embedding the figure into the background. The figure's heroic stance, the keyed up color scheme, and the grand scale make this a dramatic and vibrant portrait. This is the paper cut that inspired the background of Wiley's painting, Alios Itzak. It's a Mizra, or a decorative plaque, that would be put in a home or synagogue to indicate the direction of prayer towards Jerusalem. In the show, what you have is the grouping of decorative styles from the Arab-Israeli tradition, uh, decorative styles from the Persian traditions, decorative styles from the Ashkenazi traditions. All of these are coming together to create one unique whole. This is a portrait of Kalkadan Mashasa, a young Ethiopian Jewish hip-hop artist that Wiley met during his travels to Israel in 2010. In his lyrics, he talks about what it's like to be Ethiopian Jewish living in Israel, and he came to Israel at age four as part of the groups of immigrants in the 80s and 90s. In this portrait, he's wearing a patch of Ethiopia showing his affinity with his original country but in his lyrics he talks about his love for Israel. He's seen on this wall with a number of his friends, other Ethiopian Jews who consider music, especially hip hop music, to be a mirror of contemporary society. Wiley designed all the frames for the World Stage Israel series, which are hand carved. They include floral and vegetal motifs and crowns at the top. On his Jewish subjects, the crowns are the lions of Judah and the hands of the Kohen or priest holding a tablet with the Ten Commandments. And on his Arab-Israeli subjects, the Lions of Judah hold a tablet with Rodney King saying, can we all just get along? This particular painting is one of my favorites in the show. And the reason why I'm drawn to it is because the decorative pattern actually comes from the Jewish Museum. It's a work that I discovered as part of the tradition of Israeli paper cuts. Part of what I wanted to do was to embrace that language but to expound upon that language and to create larger and more dynamic images that celebrate not only the paper cutting tradition, but also the people who we don't necessarily see when we think about the state of Israel. <laughs> Ah, 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 ah. 
כולם רוצים להגיע לגן עדן, אבל אף אחד לא רוצה למות. יש לי מבחנה ובקבוק מי עדן כדי לברוח מן המציאות. קשה להתמודד כשאתה מועד ומתנדד בין הטוב ובין הרע. The Wallscape, which is a recreation of a nine foot painting into 33 feet, I think is an interesting and very modern way of responding to an art exhibition. And I think it's kind of clever to have a story of a story of a story, a painting of a painting of a painting. What does that say about the media that we live in? What does that say about the art consuming public and the way that we now think about announcing uh, the presence of art shows throughout the world? All of this, I think, is a very muscular and dynamic approach to putting artwork out into the world. You might notice quite early on that this is a repetition of the same model twice, but it's also the clouds referencing the hair itself. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, the clouds are sort of creating the pattern of the hair. We're obviously looking at this as hair, but we're also looking at this as phallus. We're looking at painting itself as a type of masculinist scape where the male gaze is the ultimate uh, indicator of what the aesthetic should be driven by. This decision, of course, is coming from an art historical point of view. I was also, at this point, really concerned with color as it exists within the culture. When we think about color, it's important to know how color is coded. We think about fast food, and we think about uh, oranges and, and, and reds. You think about McDonald's. During this time that I was making these paintings, I was actually looking at um, color as it exists within, within the culture. And this painting of the impossibly large Afro and the man with this sort of business suit also happens to coincide with Martha Stewart's 1999 home collection. This was a kind of seafoam green that she had on <laughs> towels and plates. All art is about power, evidence of human presence, the people that we celebrate, the things that we're great at. Look directly in there. My name is Kehinde Wiley. Eyes at that camera. I'm an artist, I'm a painter. Great. Chin down slightly. You're in my studio today. Stay exactly where you are and then we'll just... My process has always been to work from photography. And what's happening is we're doing a really great photo shoot for Grey Goose. Chin towards me. Celebrating contemporary royals. To be a modern day king means that you've got swagger. Chin down slightly. Spike Lee. I'm a big fan one of America's most celebrated visual thinkers. Eyes at the camera. Swizz Beats, an important cultural leader in American music. Carmelo, I want you to look. Carmelo Anthony is one of those sports leaders that the world recognizes. I'm excited, you know, just to be here. I was interested in rethinking the ways that kings are being made. And let's bring in the dogs. Have you ever ridden a horse? <laughs> Well, I'm beyond is just taking life in general to the next level. We can't be scared to take the risk, just like a hen needs. All right. We're done. My work is about the fact that what you see isn't always what you get. The world that's in front of you doesn't have to be the only one. Icons are different than the big chest beating paintings that I created in the past. Icons are demure. They're small. You have to paint them in your lap. And they're loud. They're, they're gold and they're blinging all out of nowhere. When I was 12 years old, my mother sent me to Russia, and it was an art camp, and it opened my eyes beyond anything you can imagine. Growing up in South Central Los Angeles, my purview with regards to what was possible politically, socially, and artistically was limited. I was able to go to the Hermitage. I was able to go to the Winter Palace and see all of the extraordinary Russian icon paintings. Fast forward all these years, I'm in love with that vocabulary. I wanted to create a body of work that had that same sense of preciousness, that same sense of scale, that same sense of quiet, but also fused the sacred and the profane. This notion of the sacred, pure, untouchable space where divinity rests, sort of muddied and sullied by this perceived notion of the black body. Light is so much a part of the vocabulary of painting that I had to shoot that through every portrait that you see. But after a while, it became such an obsession that I wanted to work with light as a medium itself. And within that, of course, is stained glass. The very ecclesiastical, dramatic specter of light shooting through colored glass is something that really functions quite dramatically when thinking of black skin. How do you use blues and greens and reds to arrive at a sense of blackness? The Dogon couple is easily one of my favorite paintings out of the Africa series. 
What I had to do was to contend with the fact that I'm an African. I grew up here as an African American. My father actually is from Nigeria. He returned to Nigeria before I was born. And so my sense of Africa is at once very American because I grew up in California, South Central Los Angeles in the 1980s. But it's also the sense of someone longing for a country that never really was part of his existence, longing for a father who was never there, longing for a sense of authentic attachment to Africa, the real Africa, not the one that's received on television. And that's, I think, what gave rise to the Africa paintings. Sure, they're pointing to the European colonial past, and sure, they're pointing to very specific works of pre-colonial African art. But I think in that is also a type of longing to be authentically related to the continent itself. And it's a really hard thing to articulate because many of us know what, it, what the African-American narrative is. Many of us have this sense of a kind of back to Africa mentality. But this isn't a stance. This isn't a, a, a trope. This is my life. And it's my life writ large in large paintings. It's my life imagined through young sitters who are then taking on the pose of the Dogon couple. It's the Dogon couple, a painting that is inspired by sculpture from a completely different group, in fact, from Senegal. But it's, I think, again, it comes back to the twinning, the doubling. It's about them, but it's about me. It's this dual uh, presence in the painting. Any consideration of my work has to take into mind the work of Barclay Hendricks. He is absolutely foundational in terms of my understanding of how can you make the history of painting relevant today. What I love about his work is you can feel the moment. You're in that room at that moment. I, I, I love the decay that happens with the fashion, the bell bottoms, the dress code is absolutely of a place and of a time. What Barclay has done is he created a very sort of informal vocabulary for the portrait. The idea that formality drives a kind of stiff self-presentation is a very European, traditional, and classical way of painting. And Barclay did away with that. What he presented was this radical notion that freedom and clarity are uh, uh, perhaps the essence of black American culture, the type of self-invention, the type of uh, spontaneity is uh, at its best the bloodline that flows through every one of his paintings. Barclay Hendricks also created this amazing double portrait. And I love doubling in painting. It's a big part of what I do. As a twin, I've been obsessed with this notion of the dual presentation of a subject. That repetition of the two girls, the repetition of two women in painting, you'll see in this exhibition, and I think it draws a very strong correlation to the Barclay Hendricks tableau. At the same time, the hair here is in that Samsonian sense, like a, a, to a totem of power. It functions almost as a phallus here. Uh, in later paintings, the hair starts to pair with uh, other sitters. There's a kind of... Uh, uh, twinning that goes on. What I'm doing here is I'm playing with color, I'm playing with uh, uh, race, but I'm also engaging uh, autobiography. I am a twin, and twinning is something that you'll see in much of the work in the exhibition and as a theme that comes back around. Uh, but the ultimate theme uh, in these earlier works has to do with the type of black masculinity that I noticed as a kid growing up a type of uh, impossible masculinity that's defined by uh, hypersexual behaviors, a propensity towards sports, uh, antisocial behaviors. Uh, that kind of uh, fetishized, sexualized criminality is something that uh, I knew very well coming out of South Central Los Angeles in the, in the 80s. Hip hop culture was on the rise. Uh, but I also knew that there was a real difference between the body that I inhabit and the one that I was consuming through the media. Uh, and as a thinker, as an artist, I wanted to sort of explore that cognitive dissonance between the culture that you receive and the body that you inhabit. For a different perspective on the man on the street, 
You need only look at the works of a rising young painter, as our Rita Braver has been doing. What feels really strange is not to be able to see a reflection of myself in that world. So the New York-based Kehinde Wiley set out to create a new paradigm. Men of color in street dress, painted in classical style, often echoing masterworks. The images are considered so hip, they've even been used as a backdrop in the Fox series Empire. Candy Wiley. Yes, indeed. And with paintings selling for as much as $400,000, the work is considered important enough that though he is only 38, a survey of his career is now on view at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth after opening at the Brooklyn Museum. His work has a broad appeal to high art culture mavens as well as to people who don't know anything about art but are taken by his references to hip hop and to street culture. But Eugenie Tsai, who curated the exhibit in Brooklyn, says that beyond their social statements, the paintings have undeniable artistic merit, as in Wiley's version of St. Andrew. There's so many ways you could read the face of this young man. Deliberate, do you think? I do think it's deliberate. I think one of the uh, hallmarks of great art is a little bit of ambiguity, where things aren't spelled out for you. There's room for interpretation on the part of the, the viewer. With his over-the-top persona, Kehinde Wiley has been compared to Andy Warhol. And like Warhol, he's a celebrity magnet. Michael Jackson commissioned this portrait. VH1 ordered up a whole series featuring rap stars. But it's been a hard road to fame. He was raised in Los Angeles, where his mom ran a second-hand goods store to support the family. About how old were you when it started to click that, hey, this is what I like to do, art's what I'm all about? My mother sent me to art classes at the age of 11. I began to have kids around me say, will you make drawings for me? Will you make a painting for me? And it really clicked. He was good enough to earn a Master's of Fine Arts from Yale. And in 2002, a prestigious artist-in-residence slot at the Studio Museum in Harlem. It was in Harlem that he found this mugshot on the street. It crystallized something that I'd been thinking about for a very long time, which is that black men have been giving very little in this world, and that I, as an artist, have the power and the potential and the will to do something about it. So he and a team of helpers began pounding the pavements of New York, asking young black men if they'd like to be photographed and painted in classical style. But some critics have charged that Wiley is actually exploiting his subjects and that the work is cartoonish. Does that hurt or do you look at it as a learning experience? You can't allow that to be what dictates your work. You simply have to say that they're talking about me. And he can be mischievous. Take a close look at Napoleon leading the army across the Alps. In small ways, I'm taking little jabs at the, the, the masculinity, the, the, the bravado. It, it, even with the fact that there's sperm cells, all of this, taking this masculinity down to its most essential component. Then there are these intimate portraits in 15th century Flemish style. So I know that this particular portrait has a special meaning for you. Well, this is the first time I've done a portrait of someone that I'm romantically involved with. This is Craig Fletcher, my partner of three years. And I think this is a perfect way of having artistic inspiration and personal stories sort of come together. Wiley has traveled the world, painting young men from Brazil to Morocco to Israel. And now he's added women to his artistic repertoire. Excuse me. As shown in the PBS documentary, An Economy of Grace, he once again chose models from the New York streets. I can tell when you're getting into it. You're like, all right, yeah. But this time, he didn't paint them in their street clothes, but in designer gowns <laughs> and fantastic hairdos. The colors aren't quite right yet. 
He finished much of the work at a second studio he keeps in Beijing, where, in a tradition dating back to the Renaissance, assistants do much of the background work. This is a rare Wiley painting where the subject turns away from us. What it does is it heightens the picture even more, so it charges the space because we want it more. And right now, the world seems to want more of Kehinde Wiley, which still amazes him. I started making work that I assumed would be far too garish, far too decadent, far too black for the world to care about. I, to this day, am thankful to whatever force there is out there that allows me to get away with painting the stories of people like me. This painting actually is a perfect example of what my process is. The model that you see in this painting is someone, a young man that I met in the streets of New York City. Most of the models that you'll see in my paintings are complete strangers. So I'll come up to them and ask them if they have an interest in posing for me, which most people say no to. Turns out that uh, approaching complete strangers in urban areas puts people's guards up. And so I've evolved uh, a practice over time of showing examples of my work, trying to convince people of the merit, the history. Uh, I invited him back to my studio, and he went through our history books. And what we uh, happened upon was this portrait of a nobleman named uh, William von Hyacinth. What I'm doing in this painting is playing positively with the history of art, but also positing the image of what it feels like and looks like to be in America during this particular time period. It's about this sort of jump in temporal space between the original object and who and where we are today. The body language is one of absolute authority and defiance. But I think it also looks quite different when transposed onto a body in the 21st century. These young black men now occupying this space once the exclusive terrain of the powerful and the rich. That shift between who gets to be in these pictures and why I think is the real meat of this project. Oftentimes when you look at a painting like this, you'll also consider scale. The size of these paintings matters as much as anything else. What I want to do for the viewer is to have an experience in which they're being possessed as much as the painting possesses the sitter. The camera, when I'm shooting the model, is always just a bit lower than eyes view, so that when you're looking at the painting, you get that sense of, of awe that was originally intended for these paintings. What I'm doing is I'm playing with the language of power, the language of power that has existed in Western easel painting for hundreds of years. And I'm trying to use certain aspects of that to my own purposes. My job as an artist is simply to ask who deserves to be on the great museum walls. I select models plucked off the street. Excuse me, can I ask you guys a question real quick? These moments of absolute chance that then become exploded into large-scale historical paintings. There's a pomp and circumstance surrounding the celebration of an individual. What I wanted to do in my own work was to be able to borrow that sense of dignity, that sense of entitlement, where an artist says that you matter. I ask each model to go through art history books, to look at the poses, and to choose who they want to be. So in a sense, what you're looking at is not just a depiction of an individual. You're looking at the history of posing. You're looking at what used to be the body language for power and dignity in the art history, but also what resonates with young black and brown men in the streets of New York in the 21st century. One of the greatest blessings as an artist is to be able to wake up every morning and to be able to change the agenda.
Our next guest is considered one of the most important and sought after painters of his generation, and his portraits are featured in museums around the globe. That's right. He's not only an art world darling, but celebrities like Denzel Washington and Elton John have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for his work. <laughs> Kahinde Wiley, welcome to Arise Entertainment 360. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. My goodness. Oh, I feel like I'm in a museum. It's beautiful work. <laughs> Beautiful Great. work. Thank so you. let's talk about your meteoric rise. My you meteor graduated rise. from Yale with an MFA in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. and in less than, than, than a decade, you've become one of the most important painters of your generation. What do you attribute your stunning success to? Well, there's, there's a level of success, certainly, that uh, matters. And mm -hmm. I think most of what matters to me is making contact with young black and brown kids out there who are seeing the work in museums. Mm. When I was a kid growing up and studying art, it was rare that you'd see uh, paintings like this in the great museums in the world. And I think that's what makes me the most proud, to be mm. able to see that and to, to go into the American street. And if I remember growing up, learning how to paint, looking at uh, a Rubens painting, for right. example, there's a great tradition of learning how to paint, studying the old masters. How do you get those colors? How do you mix? blues and reds and greens to arrive at uh, resplendent black skin. Mm -hmm. That's something that I learned uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute as a young student and later at Yale, uh, slowly fashioning a vocabulary of how to create black beauty in painting. Black beauty. Mm. Now, the New York Times explained your appeal as such, quote, his paintings are big and bold and the colors are exquisitely rich. Their iconography is hip, savvy, and spiked with references mm. to the European high art tradition. Well, that's a rave. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. What do you make of that assessment of your work? Well, it's always good to have a love letter, especially coming mm. from the New York Times, yes. but I think my biggest critic happens to be the people who spend time with those paintings on the day to day, the people who live with the works, the collectors, and certainly the public who go to see the work in museums. What I try to do is to get outside of the ivory tower, those grand mm. institutions, and go actually to cities where the population groups are perhaps underserved, people who can't afford to go to the great museums of the world, and perhaps people who you would pass by the streets on the day to day and maybe not pay attention to. Mm. It's those people who you'll see now at the Brooklyn Museum, mm -hmm. which actually will be having a show in 2015 at the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Okay. Good. Kehinde Wally, thank you so much for being here. Right. Can't wait to see you again soon. Sir, thank you very much. And you're watching Arise Entertainment 360. There's long been growing resentment among minority groups at what defines classic art has historically been devoid of diverse voices and expressions. Now one young artist is changing that one brushstroke at a time, not just by redefining art, but by reimagining the great masters. Here's ABC's Mike Bickle. Artist Kehinde Wiley has made a name for himself by putting his own spin on art history. For nearly 15 years, Wiley has taken to streets all over the world to ask men and women of color to model for his striking portraits. While distinctly contemporary, the works have a historical air to them. That's because Wiley draws inspiration from classic paintings, posing his subjects, who often appear in their street clothes, to mimic paintings by the old masters. And in doing so, he has carved out a place for a community that has traditionally been ignored throughout art history, a disparity Wiley has been aware of since his youth. As a child, your mom brought you to the Hunting Library and you saw the works of Gainsborough, Reynolds, Constable. What effect did these paintings have on you? My mother sent me to a school that allowed me to see some of the best art institutions in Los Angeles. Amongst them were 18th and 19th century examples of some of the great French and British portraits. Gilded frames, powdered wigs, jewels and, and, and lap dogs, all of this sort of strange code for class. In a strange way, what I did was I, I walked from one of the most underserved communities in California into one of the most resplendent rooms in Los Angeles. I was here able to picture things that I wanted to see. I was able to imagine what I would. And the only limitations within that field were my imagination. Despite having painted people of color almost exclusively for over a decade, Wiley's training began like so many other aspiring artists in art classes painting nude, mostly white women. I was just wondering if the challenges of moving from what I would assume it mostly painting white women in the art studio, nudes, and transitioning almost 180 to clothed black men. You know, it's arguable that I know how to paint white women better than I do black men because so much of my <laughs> educational history came from the tradition of having nude female models in live art classes. 
And to that degree, I think that it's really fascinating to know that there is very little in the way of a, of a rule book on how to get the blues and the crimsons and the greens that go into shadows and highlights of black skin. Even if the paintings aren't uh, nude portraits of white women, in a strange sense they are. In a strange sense they're indicting the ways in which we code for masculinity and code for femininity. In 2012, he shifted his focus to a subject that has always been central in painting, but historically marginalized, women. By and large, women have been there for male consumption. And even when we change the narrative, change the structure, change the subject matter, the history has been presupposed in such a way that even structurally, the way of looking is, is directed towards a male gaze. As creative creatures, we have to sort of know that habit. We have to uh, criticize it, poke fun at it, embrace it. So how does Wiley see his own work in relation to the paintings he saw as a child? You know, you are sort of recreating poses of all masters. Is it parody in a sense? What you end up with this is this type of parallel uh, a commentary. It's neither something completely new, nor it is, the be is it the original object. It's this third object that sits on its own plane that at once critiques and celebrates a history. I want to be able to create paintings that are mysterious and snarky, but I also want to make paintings that are sincere and, and able to change the world. You, you're not able to get all of that. And my job as an artist is to continue trying. Mike Bickle, ABC News, New York. Well, the exhibition here at the Petit Palais began as a provocation. The idea was for me to respond to the institution itself. And so I looked around all the walls and noticed that there was an amazing amount of paintings. So much of painting has been about the depiction of religious iconography so that one can understand, even the most illiterate masses can understand the truth of the Bible. At its heart, Art has been the tool for the state. It has been the tool of uh, kings and the powerful people. But in the end, artists have always found their way of saying what they needed to say in little small ways. The relationship between Christ and the mother is really important for this project. If you'll notice, the mother is a symbol that is at once female and male. For me, I wanted to create a body of work in which gender had no fixed form, in which that idea of uh, the transportation of the physicality of Christ into a much more spiritual state is actually mirrored in the ways in which we see gender. The depiction of God himself, and art historically, has always been that of light in the world. And so it's interesting to work with the medium of light as the sheer object of, of, of desire. I think stained glass is, at its heart, the closest thing to painting. Painting is, of course, the depiction of light. Each model in this project is complete strangers. These are people who I met in the streets, minding their own business, trying to get to work, and fast forward, they're in a grand museum in stained glass. It's important for me that these are not people who are celebrated or known. The idea of a moment of chance being exploded into something that's celebrated or recognized is a great metaphor for the story of existence itself. If you go to the downstairs part of the exhibition, you'll see that the colors of the wall even have been darkened to give you that cave-like sense of entering. But once you get there, uh, you'll find that there's this type of rapturous, uh, ecstatic painting in very large scale of the Christ. You see so many portraits where the male figure stands dominant at the forefront of the painting, and women and children and land are seen in equal measure as possessions. In my own work, the women are strident. They take the front. Kahende Wiley, A New Republic, an exhibition of large-scale paintings 
and dramatic sculptures, now through May 14th at the Toledo Museum of Art. Well, the vocabulary of painting is a vocabulary of power. Wow. Who has it? Who has the right to it? All of those grand narrative portraits that you see are showing people who feel completely self-possessed. And that's what I'm looking for when I walk the streets. Mm -hmm. That's what I look for when I see someone who's minding their own business, trying to get to the subway, right. and I say, stop for a moment. Do you mind posing for one of these pictures? Mm -hmm. Most people say no. <laughs> uh, I think what you'll find is that, you know, in New York City and most major cities throughout the world, people have this guard, this armor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Who is this person? What mm -hmm. do you want? And the idea that the reveal, in fact, is a grand narrative portrait and that it's something that honors an individual is mm -hmm. something that's quite a surprise to many. You don't want anything from them. You're giving something yes. to them, actually, and it, it is a great gift. Mm -hmm. I think I'm giving to them, but I think I'm also participating in a conversation that has a lot mm -hmm. to do with the broader evolution of, of culture. And you've been given to the world while you're traveling around the globe sharing your beautiful painting. Now, how did you go about selecting all the countries that you would be visiting part, as part of your series? And it was important for you to also focus outside of the U.S., right? Right. This whole project started as a way of sort of looking at black American culture. As I got bigger and bigger and was invited to work all over the world, I started to recognize that black American culture has been beamed out to the rest of the world. It's and one of our leading exports here. That's correct. It's true. <laughs> That's right. You can go to the streets of New Delhi and the streets of of uh, Rio and find that people are ex expressing themselves through the lens of black American creative culture. And so that's something that I try to get down in a, in a really um, open way to sort of slow down and pay attention to, to the, the small nuances and to how people express themselves. Mm. Now, I've been on a casting with you. We were in downtown Brooklyn. We spent a rainy afternoon trying to find women for one of your exhibits. That's and right. that process was very interesting to me just to watch you work. How did you go about choosing which women you would approach and how did you go about convincing them to actually say yes? Good question. And as, as you remember, it was quite a rainy day. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy because I think so much of it had to do with the camera crew and mm -hmm. with that sense of, of, of performance that was going on in the street. Many people in America respond differently than people do internationally. Really? You'll find that Americans who live in this sort of just add water celebrity post, post Paris hit mm -hmm. built in culture mm -hmm. will find uh, being approached in the streets to be, well, of course you found me. Right? <laughs> um, yes, everybody <laughs> thinks they're a star. That's uh -huh. right, right, that's right. And to that degree, you have to sort of measure up. Do I cut, do I cut it as, mm -hmm. as a, a potential uh, interaction for someone? I think those people who slowed down and looked at examples of my work and who got it and, and were curious enough to make that leap uh, became the subjects of those mm. paintings. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. That was your first exhibit that featured all women. It was called The Economy of Grace. Why did you shift from painting men to women, and what was the difference? How, how did that influence the way you produced your work? Well, gender is a huge part of it, and I think that so much of my work has to do with isolating features of power. Mm -hmm. Women occupy a very powerful place in the narrative of history painting, and I wanted to sort of isolocate that and find out what features I, uh, we could investigate within that. I did not expect Empire to be as big as it was. Lee Daniels is a very dear friend of mine, and he said, I've got this little project that I'm working on. Would you mind lending your paintings? Of course I said yes. And we all were waiting to see what it would be. He said it was either going to be the hugest success or the biggest car wreck known to man. People are paying attention. On social media alone, I get tons and tons of comments and, and get tons and tons of new fans. People who knew nothing about my work, much less the work of some of my peers. And be, by virtue of this little television show, it's starting to change the conversation. The work in the show speaks to a type of cultural temperature right now. What's going on? Well, what's going on is the art world no longer exists on this ivy tower system. The group of artists who are now being allowed access is broadening, and the level of interest comes from all walks of life. Not only the small privileged few of the 1%, but now those people who are looking at some of their cultural icons being interested in contemporary art are being turned on. It's a really exciting time to be an artist, and it's a really scary time for the old guard. Empire is an indirect relationship to the drama that America is. It's music, it's panache, it's love of art and bling. America is empire. You think I came here dressed like this for a friendly get-together? 
The surprise was that empire is also seeded with levels of complexity that people had not expected. Your sexuality, that's a choice, sir. You can choose to sleep with women if you want. It's this jagged little pill that has at once the sweetness of an exterior coat and the medicine inside. The beauty and the success of the show is that it's about high and low. It's about all of it. And so it's really hard for critics to take one part and leave the other part out. In the end, it becomes this very interesting portrait of where America is right now. We're done? Do you think art is boring? Then you've obviously never seen the work of a hot up and coming artist making waves here in New York City. Don't sweat the technique. Music and art, art and culture, past and present. Intersections this confident young artist is examining with relish. He says his work is an exploration of the people around him. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. To be acceptable as a black man is probably the subject matter of this work in some way. Kehinde Wiley is a 29-year-old artist who's painting grand portraits of contemporary urban men in poses first created by some of the greatest masters in the history of art. Kehinde Wiley thinks art should show you something you've never seen before. Art should take the familiar and represent it in such a way that it gives us hope and that it redeems the value of life itself, really. Should art make you a little uncomfortable? Yeah, sure. That usually means there's something there to be investigated. Kehinde Wiley has been investigating life through art since he was a boy in South Central Los Angeles. One of six children, his mother made him and his twin brother take art lessons to keep them off the mean streets and give them a sense of wonder. He wanted just to know everything. There was just no stopping him. He could just reproduce almost anything that he saw, just drawing and uh, he delighted in doing so. By high school, his focus and dedication impressed his art teacher. Kehinde came with a lot of talent, and yeah. I think what he had to do is to convince himself. His work was extremely skilled. What were your goals when you came to the New York art scene, in quotations? Yeah. My goals were to have a place to sleep <laughs> and to have a place to paint. But Kehinde soon had much more than that. He became an artist in residence at the Studio Museum of Harlem, where his work flourished. Kehinde has the passion of a true artist. It is in him. He is his work in many ways. And his talent comes from the fact that he's able to galvanize his passion into his artwork. His passion, narratives about men and their place in the world, real and imagined. So time after time, he's taken to city streets, seeking subjects to paint, this time in Columbus, Ohio, for an exhibition which will open there in September at the Columbus Museum of Art. First, Wiley photographs his subjects, asking them to pose in classic positions. What makes you approach one guy and not the next guy? It's the spirit. I'm looking for someone who has a spirit of self-possession. Last year, he painted portraits of VH1's hip-hop honorees, LL Cool J, Ice-T, and others. His stalwart fans include hip-hop greats like Russell Simmons. Because hip-hop has brought these people to the forefront, people who are usually locked out. It's a great statement about, you know, imagine poor people in charge people who are struggling, now the heroes. Critics agree that everything Kehinde Wiley paints is on purpose. As a painter, he is also a thinker, a performer, um, someone involved in social issues. He has a big statement to make about life. His exhibitions are theater, famous for their size and scope. What do you, what do you want people to think about you and your work after they've come to see one of your shows. What do you want them to say? I would want them to say, wow, this is an interesting spectacle. Wow, you've taken me on this historical roller coaster. Wow, I've never thought about things this particular way. I wonder what's coming next. As art critics and lovers discover and consider his work, Kehinde's mother knows anything is possible. You know, he's an artist among artists. Awfully interesting guy. And up next, the man who set out to save an ancient forest. But first, this is Today on NBC. 
everyone is fascinated by looking at another human being. There's something very intimate about the ways that people assume that by looking at certain parts of the portrait, they'll be able to understand who these people are, where they come from, and why they happen to be in this museum today. In my work, I try to slow down and see individuals. I'm standing on the shoulders of all of those artists who came before me, but here there's a space for a new way of seeing black and brown bodies all over the world. A New Republic is an exhibition that allows for every single moment within my career, all of the different acts, all of the different bodies of work to be seen. What you get is a diversity of experiences, a picture of what black American kids are up to, a picture of what the global story is with regards to how young people adorn themselves and celebrate and fall in love. It's really interesting to be able to look through the history of some of the great portraits and to say, what is it about the trappings of empire and power that we can use in the 21st century? What does it look like to be graceful? What does it look like to be proud, noble? How do you look at a young black man in American society? It's a very important question, especially at this moment in our culture. The way in which the body is seen has a lot to do with light. How does the artist choose to allow light to flow across the body? Black women have always been at the core of my thinking around portraiture. You see so many portraits where the male figure stands dominant at the forefront of the painting, and women and children and land are seen in equal measure as possessions. In my own work, the women are strident. They take the front. But there's also a sense of mystery. We don't really know who these women are. Bound is a sculptural project that looks at the presence of black women, all of those women that raised me, the graceful women who've been in my life over the years, but also the ways in which black American women adorn themselves as both a type of communication act and armor. And hair is principal within that. You see hair going outside of itself, becoming so fabulous, so extraordinarily large that it folds in under its own weight. It's beauty that becomes decay. It's a place in which the imagination starts to happen. The Brooklyn Museum is extraordinarily important for me. I remember having my first exhibition here. Being able to celebrate this moment in a place like Brooklyn where so many of the people who are in these paintings come from is an incredible blessing. In some sense, what I'm trying to do is to come to terms with the ways in which black American culture has been beamed out into the rest of the world. And that is a type of new republic. And now a winner of USA's 2010 Character Approved Award. My name's Kehinde Wiley, and I'm an artist. I make paintings of young black men from America. Growing up in Los Angeles, it was really interesting to be able to go to the museums and to see all of the great works of art. Now, one thing that I saw that was lacking, though, was that there was no one in those pictures that looked like me. And I thought that in some way, I wanted to somehow get down what it looks like to be a young, black, American kid in a picture that means something. My work quotes historical sources, and it positions young black men within that field of power. My concern is presence, a radical presence, a presence that says that I'm beautiful enough, I'm strong enough, I'm smart enough, and no one can tell me that I can't be here in this picture, and I will be here, and I'm hanging in a museum. This is not a mugshot, frontal side. This is you deciding how you get to be seen. I go through all the art history books with my models. All of these guys that I find in the streets and make into these paintings, they choose moments in art history that mean something to them. They choose aspects of their own internal selves that will then become public. And I think there's a type of joy in that. Listen, I make these paintings, but at the same time, I'm painting myself. And I want to be able to see young black American kids in paintings. The true fact of the matter is that we all deserve to be celebrated. And we all deserve to be in that space of grace. And Andy Warhol said that we would all have our 15 minutes. F the 15 minutes. I'm gonna give you a painting and I'll make you live forever. My name is Kehinde Wiley, 
and I'm character approved. USA, characters welcome. Former President Barack Obama has made another inspired choice. The Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery announced yesterday that Obama has selected artist Kahind Wiley to paint his official presidential portrait. Known for lush, larger-than-life portraits that overlay black street culture with European classical motifs, Wiley is an exciting choice for the presidential portrait. Imaginably, the New York-based artist will have a novel spin on the traditionally formal composition. The Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery commissions an artist to create a portrait of the president and the first lady after their tenure. Former First Lady Michelle Obama has chosen Baltimore-based painter Amy Sherald to paint her portrait. Wiley and Sherald will be the first black artists to create official presidential portraits for the Smithsonian. The Obama's portraits, which will surely draw selfie enthusiasts, will be unveiled at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. next year.